सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली आफ्टर वेरी लॉन्ग टाइम वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट रशिया एंड प्लीज टेक नोट दैट आई डिट से रशिया एंड यूक्रेन बिकॉज वी आर नॉट टॉकिंग अबाउट द वॉर टूडे at least not about what's happening on the battlefield let's leave that for another day soon because a lot is happening there we are talking about russia what's happening inside russia particularly with russia's economy now it's really a fascinating story because a lot that's happening in russia with russia's economy is counter intuitive a lot as you would expect is also predictable at the same time there is plenty which is not surprising and i'm saying this deliberately not surprising yet shocking now how can something be not surprising yet shocking so when inflation goes up you can expect central banks to increase interest rates but when they increase it by say 350 basis points in one day then it looks like shocking so if you want to see a comparison the highest single increase in rates that the Indian Central Bank that RBI has carried out in the past 10 years at least 10 years data we have seen is 50 basis points now they may do these in quick succession 50 basis now 50 basis points again in a, in a month etc but one time 50 basis points in this case it's 350 basis points so why now why do central bankers not cut or increase rates so drastically because that surprises the markets central bankers like to be and they are expected to be the best central bankers are boring non headline making they make non committal statements they give hints and they do not administer shocks to the market in this case the russia's central bank has administered shock to the market so elvira nabivlina who is a very highly regarded chief of russian central bank she held an emergency meeting of her board this week earlier this week in fact on tuesday how that came about i will tell you in just a second and then she increased the rates these rates have not been increased from 8.5% to 12% and once again please note that she said that on 15 september the board will meet again that means in a month from now there might be yet another increase why do we say so why can we anticipate this because just 3 weeks earlier on 21st of july she had again raised interest rates by 100 basis points so in 3 weeks 100 plus 350 rates in russia have been increased by 450 basis points if you think this looks shocking why administered such a jolt to to the russian monetary markets that's how a war economy usually looks like or can look like so what happened in russia if you want to see other shocks when russia invaded ukraine as the invasion came and the sanctions came russian government and the Cent central bank they they reacted in alarm i won't say panic in alarm because they were launching a war and they knew they were launching a war and they anticipated most of the consequences maybe they did not anticipate sanctions to be as extensive as they turned out to be and as quick as they turned out to be as swift as they turned out to be and you know no pun intended because we know that the americans cut them out of the swift payment system but the sanctions were roll out of the sanctions were really swift so what did they do they really up their interest rates immediately after the war the russian central bank up the interest rates from 9.5% to guess how much 20% that's an increase by 1050 basis points so this 350 basis point increase in comparison may not look that high and once again if you want to see the price a country is willing to pay for territory or what it sees as its own sovereign interests 14 2014 they up the rates from 10.5% then to 17%. So that was a 650 basis point increase and by 2014 you are smart so you would have figured by now that is when the Russians went out and annexed Crimea again they anticipated the sanctions and sanctions came. Now 
what is this yo-yo thing? I told you just now that they upped the interest rates from 9.5 to 20. Please see the chart. That will show you the yo-yo of these interest rates. They went up from 9.5 to 20. And then as the war settled down, even though Russia suffered heavy reverses on the battlefield, they failed to achieve most of their objectives because their objectives are maximalist. They wanted a regime change. They wanted to capture Kyiv and bring about a regime change. That didn't happen. In fact, for the past 10 months or so, Russians have been defending the territory they had captured earlier. And if anything, Ukrainians are recovering some of it almost on a daily basis. Very little in a war of attrition, but the Russians are not gaining more territory. But in spite of that, the Russians got their act together on the economy and they began cutting their interest rates. They began cutting their interest rates as Oil exports continued, oil and gas exports continued, the Europeans didn't buy it, the rest of the world, particularly India, China were buying it. And although the Western sanctions limited the price at which Russian oil could be bought by other countries, including India and China, that still brought a lot of money into Russia. So as that money came in, Russian government began rapidly cutting down their interest rates. You know why? Because Vladimir Putin has an unusual challenge. He has to continue with the war. He has to fight a big war. And in this case, he's fighting a war and not just against a small nation called Ukraine, which he is, but also be mindful of the fact that that small nation or small military power called Ukraine is backed by all of NATO and America. So he has to fight that war. He has to send a lot of men into that war. He has to suffer a lot of casualties, a lot of coffins come home. At the same time, in his economy and in his politics, he has to keep the pretense of a normal life. That is the challenge of balancing imperatives of running a war, the compulsions of dealing with sanctions, rising costs of a war, and at the same time, the political imperative of having to having to or political compulsion of having to maintain normalcy as if there is no war. In fact, formally, the Russians still don't call it a war. They call it a special military operation. Never mind the fact that it's now gone beyond its 500th day that we can talk about in the course of time. But but this is the situation right now. And that's why you see this this kind of this kind of roller coaster on interest rates. That is not something that leads to economic stability in any place. Now, why did she do it? Do it all of a sudden this Tuesday? This happened. Announcement came on Monday that she, that they were going to hold this board meeting. That announcement itself, that announcement itself affected the markets. That's because on Monday, on Monday, Maxim M A K S I M, in Russian, the anglicized version would be Maxim, right? Maxim, who is the chief economic advisor to Vladimir Putin, he wrote an op-ed article in TASS attacking the central bank almost directly, saying that, look, ruble had weakened too much. It is not in Russia's interest that ruble should weaken so much because when ruble weakens, it affects the common people in Russia. And he said the main reason, I will share the article with you. You can see the screenshot of the front page. It's in Russian uh, from TASS. But I'll share the article with you. Also, the essence of the article was that because the central bank has made money supply too easy, they've made borrowings, they made lendings too easy and borrowing too easy for ordinary Russians. They're all borrowing and spending. He didn't say that's leading, leading to inflation, but he said that's leading to a weakening of the ruble. Now, ruble has weakened. Once again, see this chart of the rubles. If you see the chart of what's happening with ruble, I will first show you the two-year chart, right? If you see the two-year chart, it tells you that the ruble was somewhere around a little below 70 rubles to a dollar, say in August 2021. That's about two years back, right? After that, the ruble weakened. The ruble weakened just after the war. It weakened so substantially that by March, by March of 2022, that's a month after the war. Obviously, there was a run on dollar in Russia. People, the rich people, oligarchs were taking their money out of Russia in dollars and euros. And Russia had a shortage because of that. Because of that, the ruble weakened and at one point went to almost 136 rubles to a dollar. Exactly the peak was 135.8 rubles to a dollar, right? That is terrible. And if that was the price, you can imagine the street price would have been higher because a lot of people were converting their ruble 
into dollar on the street and then trying to smuggle it out through Armenia, through Georgia, through Kazakhstan, the neighboring countries or any other sources or any other borders because they wanted to take their wealth out of a warring country, a country at war. So it went up to 135. But after that, as things settled down, as Russian fuel exports continued, albeit at lower prices, ruble actually strengthened and it strengthened so much that by July of 2022, it had become stronger than it was say in the July or August of 2021. So it came to almost 54 rubles to a dollar. That's when I found a lot of, lot of excitement also in Indian discussion groups, particularly Indian discussion groups of the nationalist right saying, wow, fantastic Russians because they tend to be essentially intrinsically and instinctively anti-Western and anti-dollar. See Russians, Russian ruble is actually strengthening whereas so many currencies are weakening, right? So Russian ruble did strengthen to 54 from 135. Once again, roller coaster went up, boom, it went down. Going down is a good thing in this case because the currency is becoming stronger. The realities of economics, the monetary realities set in and the ruble has been weakening since then. Then it broke this psychological barrier of 100 rubles to a dollar again. In fact, if you see from January, between January to now, the ruble has weakened to the dollar by nearly 30%, between 25 and 30%, depending on the day that you take as a cutoff date. So nearly 25 to 30% decline in about eight months. That is not something that the Russians like and that is not something that the Russian politicians like, Putin likes. That's why his chief economic advisor wrote this article, which was a signal to the central bank to quote unquote, follow the orders. I'm saying that quote unquote, follow the orders. Mr. Maxim didn't say that, but that was the message. The moment this meeting took place, in fact, the moment the news of the meeting came out, the decline of the ruble stopped, but not as much as people might have expected. It came below 100 rubles to a dollar again, just a wee bit. As we speak, it's quoting at about 97 rubles to a dollar. So it hasn't helped very much and we don't know what will happen. If you want to see also what's happened this year, that's a separate chart. You can see that also. I just showed you the chart for two years. If you see the chart for one year, that is beginning August 22 to August now, you can see there is a consistent increase, which means there is a consistent fall in the value of the ruble. It looks like an increase because the chart shows how you are getting more and more and more and more rubles to a dollar. Then it peaks at 102.2 and that's where this rate action comes in and it stabilizes a little bit. Will it remain stable and how long will it remain stable? We don't know. Now, now I had also told you that there is also stuff about Russian economy which is counterintuitive, counterintuitive and maybe also predictable. So counterintuitives, first of all. One would have thought, in fact, expectation across the world was that as Russia goes into this withering war, particularly if they don't win it quickly, which they did not, in fact, they haven't won it at all. And they are right now on the defense right across the uh, frontier, which is a very wide frontier of more than a thousand kilometers. That it's a very expensive war that the Russian economy will go into a tailspin because they faced sanctions. They were cut out of SWIFT. The Americans cut them out of the dollar system. Even those who can buy their oil and gas can't pay in dollars. So Russians had all these challenges and you would expect Russia's economy to collapse. That has not happened. In fact, the Russian economy suffered a little bit. It suffered in fact in 2022 and part of 2023. So if you look at the chart that I am showing you, Russian economy in 2021 had begun to boom. It had begun to boom mainly because Commodity prices were going up. Commodity prices also include oil, but Russia is also the source of many other commodities. By the way, also food grain. Russia is among the biggest suppliers. It is the biggest supplier, biggest exporter of wheat in the world. Many other food related commodities also. So 2021 until early 2022, Russia's economy was doing very well. 2022, it began to decline middle of 2022 it began to decline you can see it on the chart minus 4.5 minus 3.5 2.7 i'm looking at months 2.7 minus 1.8 it begins to get better and then it began to pick up and now at this point it is growing at 4.9 percent 
Now it is growing at 4.9% and that has become a cause for concern. First of all, it's counterintuitive. It's Ukraine's economy which has got devastated, which is all in negative growth. Because Ukraine is a smaller country, a smaller economy. Ukraine is not a commodity exporting country. In any case, Ukraine's economy is now underwritten by the West. But Russia's economy, the expectation particularly on the Western side was that Russia's economy will collapse and Putin will be down on his knees. That has not happened. So at this point, Russia's economy is growing at 4.9%. That's very healthy, right? That's very healthy in today's global situation. But that is also a cause of concern for the Russian economic leaders because they think, and they are right, they think that this boom in the economy, this counterintuitive boom came because again, under the political imperative of having to show normalcy to the ordinary citizen, the monetary authority was made to cut rates too quickly. That led to heavy borrowings, too easy borrowings, because Russia is not a low interest rate uh, economy. Russia has always had interest rates, at least for a long time, which, is, which are higher than most developed countries. They, in fact, put too much money in the market, too many people borrowed, too many people bought new things. Because of that, you see growth. At the same time, at the same time, because of Western sanctions and because of multiple other factors, including, first of all, that the government has got a lot of the industry only producing for the military. Second, there's been a flight of human talent, human capital. So there have been two waves of migration or immigration, emigration uh, in the past year from Russia because of the war. And Russia also has a declining population, declining population, declining and heavily aging population. I will give you some data on that as we go along. A combination of that then ensured that enough was not being produced, enough produced in Russia was not available to people for people to buy with this money. So the prices start going up. So inflation in Russia went up. Once again, counterintuitive. You would have thought that, oh, inflation in Russia means would have gone to 20% or 40% or 50% like Turkey, no such thing. Inflation in Russia over the past three months has been, has gone to 7.6%. That for Russia is high because Russia's existing inflation rate was 4.4% annually. And Russia's central bank says that their tolerance level is the peak of 4%. Russia is a more developed economy. So while in India, we might say 6% is acceptable in a more developed de developed economy, anything, anything that looks like 7%, 7.6% looks troublesome. And this is a country which has elections next year, su such as the elections might be in Russia. But Putin has to worry about public opinion because he has to pretend that he's win winning and everything's okay. So the central bank governor, while upping the rates has only blamed inflation. She has not talked about the weakening of the ruble. Now, what do we mean when we say that because Russians are not able to produce enough right now, their factories are not being able to produce enough, prices are, are rising. Why can't the Russians import? So once again, counterintuitive. You might think that this is a war economy. Russia has been cut out of the global economic system. So they must be, must be finishing the forex reserves. That's not true. See this chart again. Look at the movement of Russia's forex reserves. They hit their bottom, which wasn't, wasn't so little. It was three, $350 billion, right? It's a lot of money. They hit their bottom in about 2015. And since then, they've been rising steadily. And one reason they've been rising steadily is that the global commodity prices have been rising steadily. And Russia is a storehouse of the most valuable commodities in the world, from oil to rare metals to titanium to zinc to nickel to all kinds of things and food grain, as I told you. So see this foreign exchange reserves in Russia have been rising. They reached a peak of about $640 billion, say in the beginning of 2022 when the war started. Today, again, they are $586 billion. So that puts them in the same ballpark as India's foreign exchange reserves. And India is a much bigger economy. India is a much bigger country. Russia has a population of 14.5 crores and declining, which is one tenth of India's population. Russia is an economy, which at this point would be about 60% of India's. Russia's GDP would be about 60% of India's. But Russia's foreign exchange reserves are about the same 
as India. At the same time, even if Russians wanted, even if Putin wanted to throw dollars in the market from his reserves, to import things, to cool down prices in his country, he cannot do so because he cannot import most things. He's barred from more, most markets from importing. Plus, he can't use the dollar in many of these markets. That's the reason Russians sometimes complain to us Indians that, look, it's okay for us to, to sell you oil in rupees. But tell us what, what, what can we do with those rupees? When the Chinese pay us in yuan, we have stuff to buy from China. We don't have stuff to buy from you. In fact, what the Russians have been doing lately, and I notice uh, some data coming out here and there, and soon enough, we might have a story on that. It seems that Russians are investing some of that surplus rupee that they have into Indian sovereign bonds now. Now, Putin at this point, to sum up what we've been discussing, Putin at this point has multiple challenges. He has the impossible challenge of balancing multiple contradictory objectives. One, he has to finance the war. Number two, he has to maintain economic stability in the country. He can't afford to have a war economy in the country. Number three, he has to fight inflation, but again, not so brutally that it causes recession. If you look at his inflation rate, in fact, today, it is still not as high as the Americans have it and many West European countries have it. But those countries go through cycles. Those countries are much richer on a per capita basis. They also have much more vibrant economies. They are not commodity led. In Russia, incomes are not so high and incomes have not been rising at that rate. So he has to fight inflation. At the same time, he has to make sure a recession does not take place. And he has to maintain a facade of a nation being at peace. Now, I told you earlier that there is an issue with Russian production at Russian factories in terms of human resources. So there have been two rounds of emigration, two waves of emigration since the war began. So a lot of the killed Russians, they left. In fact, many of them left for Turkey and other neighboring countries, but continue to hold their jobs. If you could work from home as they did during COVID, they could live in another country and work from there. They also took a lot of their savings away. In fact, a lot of the Russian lawmakers have talked sometimes in terms of taxing them or repossessing their wealth, etc. They haven't done so, which is quite wise because that will again create a run. But a lot of the talent left from Russia. Then 300,000 people, three lakh people have been recruited as part of the fresh mobilizations in the armed forces. And number three, Russia itself has a declining population and an aging population. How it's declining, I will tell you. First of all, the birth rates are really low, but look at the life expectancy. If you look at the larger figure, the basic figure, 71.3, it's about the same as India and countries in India's ballpark. So Russia being a developed country with, with a much larger per capita income and very good social indicators compared to India in many areas, particularly education, etc., you would expect them to have a higher life expectancy, but it's 71.3. But underlying that is one more brutal fact. That this 71.3 is actually distorted by the fact that Russian women live much longer than men. So Russian women have the life expectancy of 76.4 years. Men have only 66.49. That's really low. Now that is, that is all adding up to a shortage of labor in the countries, skilled labor in the country's factories. So I, I picked up two quotes from Wall Street Journal stories and I'm sharing both these stories with you. I'll share the links with you. Please read them. So the first one is Central Bank Chief Elvira Nabiulina, one who increased the rates just now. She said, and I quote, such a situation in labor market is a considerable constraint on future expansion of output, unquote. And then she went on to cite shortages in, again quote, machine building, metallurgy, mining and quarrying. Those are the main engines driving the Russian economy. There are, there are shortages there. And then there is a quote from Putin himself. He went to an aircraft making factory in East Siberia in a town called Ulan Ude. And he said there, and, and I again quote from him, and he said that there is a lack, and I quote, there is a lack of highly qualified specialists which impedes and again, I quote from Putin, we understand that many enterprises now work practically three shifts and there's a shortage of specialists, especially highly qualified specialists. So if you look at these details, you will see that I have delivered to you all the three things I promised about Russia's economy. Number one, what's counterintuitive? 
Number two, what is not surprising yet shocking and third, what is predictable. So what is predictable is the shortages of skilled people in Russia's factories, for example, besides much else.